just kind of lying about it. I thought you did. Great. Oh, wow. Um, my name is Simon Schachter. I'm YCOR's Chief Strategy Officer. Um, thank you so much for coming. We're really excited to hear from Shannon. Thank you so much for taking your day. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't know, YCOR is a community of people who inspire, supports, and connects the next generation of social change makers through high-impact philanthropic activities. That means that we, our main program gets four or five fellows together, all young professionals, to do a high, high sorry, intensive capacity building project for a local nonprofit on a local cause. So we have some amazing nonprofits we're working with this year that you'll hear about in just a little bit. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the story of where we've been and where we are now. So we um, started last year, kind of our year zero, with three pilot projects on the peninsula. We had 12 fellows, 12 volunteers, and we had over 250 plus hours per project. These include creating a women's empowerment financial literacy program, uh, teaching online training for yoga teachers who went to juvenile justice um, for girls in the juvenile justice system. And we really had what we thought was an impactful program at that point. We still went back to the drawing board. We felt like we had a lot of changes to make. And so this year, we have four projects that we are really proud about and that um, I'm not going to talk very long. So you're just going to hear um, a, little about that, a little bit about each of those projects right now. So um, uh, Brittany, do you want to talk about Code 2040 briefly? Should I come up? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'm Brittany. I'm working on a project, uh, my team of five. Some of them are here, actually. Raise your hands, maybe. There they are. Um, are working on a project with Co2040, which is a group that uh, tries to increase the number of black and Latino technologists um, in the tech industry. Um, and what we're working on is we're working with them to create a marketing campaign to help them reach companies and communicate with companies about why diversity is important. Huh? Where are we? Oh, uh, in our project right now, we are kind of brainstorming strategies for uh, what we want to do next. And uh, some of that is going to be uh, potentially creating some marketing material for them to, to give to companies, as well as helping to kind of uh, measure their metrics of success and be able to share that more uh, well with companies, as well as share their kind of fellow stories and why diversity matters uh, for, from a company's perspective. Cool. Who's next? <laughs> Hi guys, um, my name is Ellen. Uh, I am working with the Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center along with my excellent teammates, mo most of whom are here. Um, so we are creating a technology toolkit for disadvantaged entrepreneurs. Um, basically, we want to help small businesses navigate the confusing landscape of technologies available for small businesses. Um, so we're creating a toolkit and a workshop for them. Hi, I'm Rima. Um, nice to have you guys all here. I'm working with my awesome team. A few of them are here um, with New Door Ventures. Um, where's Nancy? Um, with Nancy Gallegos. Um, so New Door Ventures is a nonprofit based in San Francisco, and they prepare disconnected youth for just work and life and job opportunities overall. Um, so we're working with one of their ally partners, Pedal Revolution, um, which is also a San Francisco-based nonprofit bike shop. Um, and so we're working with them on um, streamlining kind of their rental process so that they can hopefully um, kind of use that as a growth model and hopefully, um, you know, obviously increase their profit there and most importantly be able to hopefully employ some more youth um, and apply that kind of just to future ally partners, any current ally partners um, to be able to scale the entire organization. Hi guys, I'm Alex. Um, my team is working with Kiva Zip, which is a US-based pilot of Kiva Proper. Um, they work to get 0% interest loans to entrepreneurs and small business owners around the world. Um, Kiva Zip asked us to help them understand how to attract and retain borrowers in the Bay Area. So it's a sticky question, um, and our project has been twofold. First of all, um, building a direct mail marketing campaign and testing it in the Bay Area, and then also building borrower personas, which will hopefully eventually inform their future marketing strategy. Um, I feel silly talking about this because all the hard work has been done by my fellows, mostly, <laughs> primarily. Um, Alec and Jessica are sitting right here, and then Nancy and Joyce, who are right now at the Kiva Oakland launch, which is happening tonight. 
So if you're interested in any of those projects, please talk to our fellows afterwards, grab a beer with them. They're so amazing. Um, I wish I was a fellow again. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest components of the Y-Core program is we get to do a speaker series where the fellows get to learn about different ways that they can create social impact in their lives. So last month we had Jen Dolsky, who's the president of change.org. We're lucky enough to have Shan Farley today. Um, we're going to have an entrepreneurship panel next month on April 13th and an impact investing talk in May. And then our demo day, which you should all come to on June 16th, we'll have Fred Blackwell, the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, talk. And you'll hear about what all the projects did and what they're able to achieve in the time we had and what they're looking forward to doing after the program. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Shannon. Shannon Farley what is the CEO and founder of Fast Forward, which is what I think is the top nonprofit tech incubator. And a lot of people talk about Y Combinator and these other random things. It's really Fast Forward that's paving the way um, for all nonprofit tech. Uh, she, she founded the W. Haywood Burns Institute, which helps juvenile justice reform. She then became the founding executive director of Spark, which is a millennial philanthropy organization and one of YCOR's partners. And now, she, then she, after that, started Fast Forward. And she'll tell you about the tech and nonprofit landscape, a little about the companies, and why she's excited about kind of this path that I think we all are really passionate about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. As Simon was saying, I used to run a network of young people who were interested in giving back in all the ways that we can, in our time, in our energy, in our networks. So I'm just thrilled to be here with an aligned organization. Thank you so much for inviting me. One of the things that I often get asked is, how did you get started? Like, how did you become a social entrepreneur and decide that that was the thing that you should do in the world? And um, I would say my mom would also like to know, like, how <laughs> did this happen? Um, and I wish I could say it was like a lightning bolt moment, but that's not really how life works for me anyway. I had a work study scholarship. And in this particular scholarship, you could like check IDs at a library or in the, work in the cafeteria, or it was a Jesuit school, so you could also go to an NGO. And I chose a domestic violence shelter in DC to do my work study job. And because it's work study, you don't get to choose the schedule. So I went, I would be there from 4 a.m. until 9 a.m. four days a week. And my job was intake. And what that means in a shelter is that you are there when someone comes in and you help them get settled so that they can get the services they need for the next day. But when people come into violent shelters, anti-violent shelters, they are coming off probably the worst night of their life, but really months and maybe years and a whole lifetime of beatings and brokenness. And what they get is a pile of paperwork, like no joke. Like we had to go through 50 pages of driver's license applications because maybe you need a new name or school applications because your kids need a place to go the next day or applications for food stamps or housing any number of things like you don't end up in a place like that unless you really have no resources that you can safely access and i just couldn't believe it that we as a community and a country treated people in their most dark moments with paperwork and it was the kind of thing that like would keep me up at night like, why is paperwork a barrier to getting the things you most need? In the software enterprise space, we see how technology has revolutionized how people access the things they need, from healthcare to, you know, on my phone, I can get 90 different kinds of services, right? But here I would sit with a woman after a terrible thing had happened to her and her family, and I couldn't get her any of the same services with that ease. And like, I just, I thought about it all the time. And it is the thing I cared most about. And um, I think when you decide to be an entrepreneur, you, you have to do the thing that you must do, right? Like it's not the thing that you want to do always, and it's not the thing that you have to do always, but it's the thing that you can't help but do. You're thinking about it all the time, you're reading about it all the time, you're talking to people about it really all the time. And if that's how you are, you know, maybe you're an entrepreneur. And you should think about the path in which you want to get started. 
So as Simon was saying, um, in that time period, I got very interested in prison reform. Because if you are interested in policies, and those, that pile of paper is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of policies that resulted in forms which impact people's lives, right? So if you're interested in what got you to 50 pages of paper, you're interested in policy. And prisons are where policies go to die, right? Like if there's a problem in the healthcare system, it shows up in the prison system. If there's a problem in the transportation system, if you can believe it, um, it shows up in the prison system. One of the most major causes of bench warrants Anybody knows what bench warrant is? Bench warrant means that you didn't show up for your court case on time, which means that your charge escalates, is not knowledge, but bus fare, right? So transportation systems policies impact our prison policies. So I became obsessed with it, and I couldn't go to sleep at night, and I was thinking about it and talking about it, and um, that's how we ended up starting the Burns Institute. And I was there for a while, and um, I became very interested in the way that money flows into issues. It looks a lot like the 50 pages, pages of paper, right? How people make decisions about where they get money, how people who are impacting movements and organizations and communities get money is really about power. And so I became obsessed again, and I couldn't sleep. And then we started Spark, which is now the largest network of millennial philanthropists in the world. But at the time, it was an email list of 80 of our friends who we bummed into getting them to come to a happy hour and put money into a pot. And that's how we made our first grant. And if you can think, this was before crowdfunding, right? Like it's 2004 and we had a PayPal account and like email, there was no Facebook. We're a little old. Uh, there was no Facebook. None of us had Facebook accounts. It existed, but uh, we had graduated already. So we didn't have access to the .edu accounts anymore. And um, so we just started it and got going. Uh, and then I had this experience at Spark over the seven years that I was there, that I was living in Silicon Valley, like in the middle of a software revolution in every way. Every person I was talking to on the bus and at parties and in my life were building things that were changing the way that businesses were run. And it became very clear that the grassroots women's organizations that I was working with in Tanzania and in Peru and in San Francisco did not have access to that software in a meaningful way. The people who were building, for the, building software did not have their experiences and did not understand the use cases that they were living in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I had this like regular experience of people would come because we were a funder, which means we were an investor. So people would come in with an idea and it was invariably someone who was really well intended, who had built an app for someone in the world who they believed needed help. And my particular experience was it was this guy who'd been to Peru and had seen that so many women were illiterate um, Peru had had a big earthquake at the time. Many men were killed. And so none of the people transacting business had, were literate. And he was like, you know, we can make it easier for people to make money if we just teach them to read. So he built this mobile app that was gorgeous. And he was like an education guy, so it was all academic backed, like all of the research and how the app should work was very well researched. Um, but I looked at it, and like he clearly never hung out with women in rural areas in Peru because it was on a smartphone. Most women there have dumb phones, right, or data phones. Uh, it was in Spanish. It's not the native language. And, uh, <laughs> and this was not going to be used by the people who needed it most. And again, like I couldn't sleep, and I thought about it all the time, and was talking to, to people about it all the time, thankfully, because one day at a party, I sat next to a guy. And this guy was Kevin, who's now my co-founder. And Kevin Berenblatt, he started a company called Context Optional, which he had sold to Adobe Social. And he, as a technologist, was like in this moment in his life when he was on basically a philanthropic walkabout. And he was looking for ways as a technologist to give back his expertise. And he saw all these really cool organizations, but none of them who like really knew how to leverage his know-how. He'd, he'd offer to volunteer and they'd, you know, the organization would say, that's awesome. Can you set up my Facebook account? <laughs> like, yes, but um, you know I can do so much more. So um, we got to talking, and he asked me, "Why aren't there more Wikipedia's or Khan Academies? Right? These are organizations you guys have probably know about, right? Wikipedia. They are nonprofits. 
So they are companies that have chosen a nonprofit tax model to do their good in the world. And do you have the clicker? I'll talk a little bit about that. I will talk a little bit about that. Oh, do you mind switching it? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. This is my favorite question to ask in any room. Okay. Which of these is not a nonprofit? IKEA, Burning Man, or the Academy Awards? Okay. We have some votes from IKEA. Anyone anyway, else? Burning Man. I heard a Burning Man. Anyone else? Burning Man? Academy Awards. Okay, great. And we, and we heard of none of them. Guess what, guys? All of those are nonprofits. Yeah. So um, <laughs> IKEA is, is uh, the strongest revenue generating nonprofit in the world. It is, <laughs> it is owned by a, a foundation. It is a for-profit subsidiary of a Swedish foundation. And their mission in the world is to promote modern design. I think you can see by the room that we're sitting in, it worked, right? <laughs> like we are all part of their mission. Uh, the Academy Awards is an association. Many associations that you guys probably belong to are nonprofits. Burning Man is an art and culture festival, which some of you may know by other experiences, but the truth is they're promoting <laughs> art and culture. And they selected a nonprofit classification because it's a business model. It's really just a tax differentiation. So one of the things I hear from folks all the time is, oh, I'm going to start this thing, and we've decided to be a social impact for-profit company. And um, I think it's because people don't understand that nonprofits can earn revenue. Nonprofits, it's a business model. It should be a choice. And the choice should be about the kind of customer you want to serve or the space that you want to work in. Um, they are businesses. We are subject to all the same laws that all other businesses are subject to. We pay taxes. We file tax returns. And the difference is our information is public. So you, can, you all could look up right now how much I earn and how much everyone who works for me earns. It's a, very, it's a different business model, but it's certainly still a business model. Now. Um, they look the same, right? We have brick and mortar business models in the for-profit world and in the nonprofit world. Those would be, you know, Glide Church uh, or your mom and pop store service delivery. Um, that would be anyone who's providing a service for the common good and then, or just service, and then product companies. And those are the kinds of organizations that I work with at Fast Forward. Fast Forward is the first and only accelerator exclusively for tech nonprofits. And I will talk a little bit about what that is. Tech nonprofits are organizations where the software or the hardware that they're building is the core of their good in the world. So like Wikipedia is a nonprofit. The core of their good in the world is they want to be the world's library. They use a community of people to produce the information that goes into that library. Well, the thing is, is that Wikipedia also has a for-profit model that looks just like it, and it's called Reddit. It uses a community of people who produce information and content for that model. Now, they're doing the same thing, in, they're doing the same thing as a business model, but they have chosen to serve different customers for different purposes. Therefore, they chose different tax models. Um, that is true of crowdfunding. There's really good examples in that. Indiegogo versus Charity Water. Who here has heard of Charity Water? All right, so Charity Water is a crowdfunding platform for water around the world, but they don't build the wells themselves. They don't make sure that the water's clean. They, it's just a way to get money to organizations who are building wells and making sure that they're kept up, which is the same of Indiegogo or Kickstarter, right? Both of which are B Corps, by the way. These are organizations that are using crowdfunding to do things in the world. Udemy, Khan Academy, same business model, and Volunteer Match and One Brick. Have you guys heard of these? Okay, so these are really important for you guys to know about because clearly you're wonderful. 
And the thing that you can do with these two companies, both for and nonprofit, is discover volunteer opportunities. Right? They are platforms of discovery for organizations that are looking for support. You can also do that with your LinkedIn account. One of the great features of LinkedIn right now is that um, you can post the things that you can do and what opportunities you're looking for. Um, most of the nonprofits we know use it as a search platform to find people, so you should do that tonight when you go home, no matter what. Uh, but when you're not doing that or working as a fellow for y -Corps, both Volunteer Match and One Brick are great. Volunteer Match, um, you have to pay for the listing on Volunteer Match, which is how they make money as a for-profit. One Brick has decided not to charge nonprofits to make it easier for them to post. Both are valid, but they're different uh, tax models, but they're not different business models. So we work with organizations that have decided to use a nonprofit status. And they do that because um, either the industry that they're working in, which requires a Good Samaritan status to do what they're doing, um, or they do it because of the customer they want to serve. So I'll give two examples. So up here in the corner, corner is Serum. That was a company in our first cohort, cohort, I should say, for organizations who go through our accelerator, we function like a Silicon Valley tech accelerator does. We give them money. So we give them $25,000 and 13 weeks of training, and training in all the things that a tech nonprofit would need, which is like half tech training, things on growth hacking, architecture optimization, um, hiring of engineers, and all the things that a nonprofit would need, board management, fundraising development, uh, social media marketing. And um, we do that over 13 weeks. We then connect them to 100 mentors. And the mentors are leaders in the tech world, so most of them are founders of their own startups, um, and leaders in the philanthropic world. Because if you're a tech nonprofit, you have to get really good at three things. And all those three things are storytelling. But the audiences are different. So you have to story tell to the other technologists who are going to help you build out your product and get behind you. You have to story tell to the foundations and the individual donors who may want to invest in your idea. And then you have to story tell to the constituents that you are ultimately serving. So we do this over 13 weeks. Our application is currently open. So I'm happy to talk about what we're looking for in the Q&A. But here's some examples of our alumni. Serum is an organization that wanted to work in an area which required Good Samaritan coverage. It's a prescription drug donation platform. So there's $6 billion of unused, unexpired drugs that hospitals in the US incinerate every year. It's, it's crazy, right? It's insane. So um, what happens is, let's say, you, what's your name? Sahana? Sahana. Okay, so Sahana is sick, and we're bummed. And Sahana goes to the hospital, and she's there for one night. So while you're there, maybe they give you some antibiotics. But the way insurance procurement happens is they get a pill pack of 28 days of pills for the one night that you're there. And they can't just send the pills home with you because it's a heavily regulated industry. So they then have to put the pills into biomedical waste disposal. But it came in a pill pack. So at the end of a shift, a nurse literally pops the pills out of a pill pack to then put into recycling the paper and the pills into biomedical waste disposal. So it's terrible for the environment. It's also an incredible human resource loss. And it's just awful, right? Like there was someone who needed a pill who should have just been able to get the extra pills. The drug company was probably going to give them away anyway. How do you get the pills to the people who need them the most? So they set up a database. And it's basically like a match.com for medicine. It connects the hospitals who have the pills, and it sends it to a clinic that needs the pills and needs to get them at a cheaper cost for people who need them most. And as a business, it's a gorgeous business model, right? Like they get paid by the hospitals because the donation of drugs is cheaper than biomedical waste disposal, right? And they get paid by the clinics because it's cheaper than buying the drugs on the open market. But they're a nonprofit. Does anyone want to guess why? Because it's drugs. It is like crazy regulated. <laughs> they need to, to have the trust and faith of a nonprofit tax status to be able to do their business. Um, it's, reg it's only legal in 14 states at the moment even to donate drugs. So imagine if they had started as a for-profit 
they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing now. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about Serum, you know, when we met Serum, it was three Stanford students. They uh, were using like credit cards and student loans to live. They were building it. They were all three living in the same dorm room. And uh, I think their total budget was 300,000. So they went through the program and they were picked up by Tech Press, other funders. They got accepted to Y Combinator. Um, they did really well. And the whole time, they were serving hundreds of thousands of patients. And now they, um, they were recently recognized as Forbes Changing, Changing the World Awards. They won a million dollar award. And uh, just last week, they opened their first free pharmacy. And this actually came from advice of one of our mentors. One of our mentors was listening to how difficult it was to find hospitals that were willing to get on their platform. It was hard. It's sales, right? You, you talk to 100 people and maybe three bite. Um, and they're a small staff and they're still living in this dorm room. And so how are they going to do this? And one of our mentors is like, why aren't you guys a mail order pharmacy? And they hadn't thought about that. If, as a mail order pharmacy, you don't face the same kind of regulations. And so they're piloting one in San Jose right now. It's a fully free pharmacy. They're doing it with another two other nonprofit partners. And we'll see six months from now how many people they're able to serve. One of the things that's really beautiful about these models is that they used the technology is not the most complicated part. It's a database. You know, <laughs> the database prints out the shipping label. Like this it is not complicated technology. But the use cases are different. Um, so we often find that the people who discover the use cases are also different. The founder of Serum um, is this young woman who grew up in West Philadelphia, which is a very low income area. She, her family, many of them struggled between paying for their prescription drugs versus paying rent every month. So this is something that kept her up every single night. It should be easier to pay for prescription drugs. And the technology should not be the barrier. So she created Serum. So that's a good Samaritan case. The other case is when um, you want to serve a customer that could not afford the product that you want to sell unless it was a nonprofit. And um, my favorite example of that at the moment is Talking Points. So Talking Points was founded by this woman, Hee Jae Lim. And Hee Jae Lim is a Korean immigrant. And she had a teenage sister who was really acting up. And uh, her mom was in Korea at the time. And when her sister would skip school, the school would text her mom. But her family migrates. And um, her mom speaks English. But like most of the people in her community that they're closest with do not. And you know, their kids, teenagers in all communities, act up. And she realized that like the parents in her community were never going to get a text from the school that their kids were messing up. And she did some more research about this. And she found out that the number one indicator of how well kids do in life is not zip code or family income level. It's parental involvement. But if your parents don't speak English, they don't get to be involved. And she was like, you know, like with Google Translate, I can work out most things, right? Between my family and my community and the world that we live in. So she took $2,000 out of her student loan and she built a pretty rudimentary app piecing together Google Translate and Twili free Twilio credits. And she put 3,000 people in the Ravenswood School District on this app. And she saw immediately, like people were texting their kids' teachers all the time. Because it's not like they didn't want to know. They just didn't have a way to access them. Now, um, Talking Points is doing really well. They've moved into other school districts. There is a for-profit competitor, Remind. Right? Remind is an education platform. They have sort of homework alert texts, but it's mostly, it's a different customer because they're serving sort of wealthier school districts that can afford that SaaS platform. Um, they're also not communicating with parents. So HeJ was in this moment of like, should I be a nonprofit? Should I be a for profit? And we asked her, like, okay, who do you want to serve? And she's like, I want to serve people like my mom and my friends and my community. And so the obvious, the obvious answer was, well, then you should be a nonprofit. You can't charge for the service, or people won't use it. And so, um, or you can't charge much for the service, or people won't use it. So she charges a nominal fee, and people are able to text for free. Um, those are the two examples. And I'm happy to answer questions about any of our groups. 
but you should know they, they look and operate just like tech startups, right? They have co-founder models, they have CTOs, the, it's heavy in engineering staff, but they need lots of things. It's a little hard to see, but they're hiring all kinds of positions at the moment. They're hiring developers and program designers, but also communications people and sales people, um, business development people. So if any of you are looking for a job at a tech nonprofit, a job with meaning, these are really great places to look. They pay, uh, they have benefits, there's good reasons to know why you go to work every day. Yeah. I think that's true. That when I started in my career, you could kind of be a nonprofit person, or you could be a for profit person, or you could be a government person. And those were very different sectors. And now, most of the people I love and respect have sort of pivoted amongst all of those different sectors. And the truth is, to run a nonprofit well, you need business skills. To run a for profit well, you need human skills. Uh, and to be good in government, you need both. And the, we all need everything. But yeah, there is the skills that you gain in one place, you can get in another. Which I think is what's so valuable about a program like y -Corp, that um, many of the professional development skills I got, I got them through volunteering with an organization. Like if you wanna learn how to facilitate a meeting, if you wanna learn budgeting, how to read a balance sheet, it's pretty safe to practice in, in a volunteer capacity. Um, and yeah, so most of my professional development came in those spaces, working in organizing, working for movements, working at the domestic violence shelter. Uh, you get leadership exposure really early, which can be hard in a large corporate environment. Um, it can take longer. So yeah, I think that the language has changed, but what happens behind the doors is the same. I guess that's the point that you talked to that I, I guess it has to be for your model of engagement. Yeah, I would say that like my groups self identify as weirdos, right? Like <laughs> they will go to a tech meetup and people are like, I don't under, like, you didn't get equity? <laughs> like they don't understand, they're like, no. They're like, you're gonna get paid working for a nonprofit? And they're like, yeah, some. <laughs> uh, they, don't, like, they don't understand why they choose that. And the same thing happens when they go into nonprofit spaces. They're like, you're a software company? Then like, I don't, I don't get you. But um, I think that's because they're not as visible. And one of my jobs as an ecosystem player is to make sure that the stories of these really amazing founders who are building big things that will be at scale shortly are out in the world. Uh, yeah. I'd love to learn more about how you guys value each of your agents. Yeah. So, um, first and foremost, we're interested in the leaders. We want to know how big their idea is and do we think they have the grit to pull it off. Um, it's very important to us that there's technical talent in leadership. Um, tech talent is expensive and technical people make decisions differently. So you want someone who's making the decisions about the strategy of the organization to have the power to move the organization. Too often in the nonprofit space, people have had this idea of like, oh, we want an app. <laughs> so they hire like a consulting firm to build the app and then they don't realize that that's actually just the first step. If you're going to be a tech nonprofit, technical leadership needs to be. Um, present and powerful, just like it would for a tech startup. We are sector agnostic, meaning that we'll fund health, environment, human rights, education. We had an animal rights group recently apply. Um, we are more interested in this, the potential for the idea. Um, and what else? And we uh, screen for diversity. So um, 
we believe that people solve the problems they see and that often the people who see the problems are the most under-resourced. So um, personal experience with the problem is a preference. And if you don't have personal experience, you should have lived in the country that you're going to serve or you should have um, worked in the organizations that you're intending to serve in a meaningful way. In the back, and then I'll come to you. Um, I'm really glad that you said this is just an idea at yeah. a nonprofit that came in like the early 70s um, and is expanding in that space. Um, I'm wondering, just kind of along the lines of comparing these business models to like the nonprofit profit and for profit, if there is some sort of analysis that nonprofits can have, like, because I mean, you generate revenue, but if there's some way of standing, you know, some like the business model. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's like some sort of competitive advantage. Lower marginal costs, right? That, um, you know, for all of my organizations, most of the software they're piecing together, they get for free, right? Like Twilio gives their mobile credits. You guys know what Twilio is, right? Like it's a back end for text communication. When Lyft sends you the text that your driver's there, that's Twilio. Um, they get it for free. And you wouldn't be able to do that as a for-profit. Uh, so it is cheaper to maintain. Um, it can be harder to raise the money in the front end, but for for-profits, there, there's also a capital crunch, right? It just tends to happen in Series A. For nonprofits, the capital crunch happens earlier. Um, foundations typically will not invest in you until you have proven impact. So if you were running a soup kitchen, you could do it out of your home. You could serve people and say like, hey, I'm good at cooking food. I know where hungry people are. We've worked it out please help me open up a kitchen. And you would be able to get a foundation to do that. If you were building the app to find a soup kitchen, you'd have to build the app before someone would give you money and prove that you had all of that. And it, it has a real cost up front. So um, until we're able to educate more funders, which is one of the responsibilities that Fast Forward has taken on, uh, it, the crunch will be rough for nonprofits in the beginning. But so you can get free services, the marginal costs are lower. Um, it's also, often easier to sustain. This is one of the greatest ironies, right? Like I hear so often that people like have decided to start a for-profit business because they want to be quote unquote sustainable. Well, one of the things that happens in the nonprofit space is there are thousands and thousands and thousands of nonprofits who never hit scale, but are sustainable. Like they're still open and they're open for 20 years. They have budgets under a million dollars. They're serving people. They're struggling every year to get fundraising goals, but they're alive. That's not true in the for-profit space. So it is possible to get to a particular threshold of sustainability in a nonprofit, which I think is, can be harder at a for-profit. It's also a little bit harder to scale in a nonprofit. So again, like we encourage people to think about who you wanna serve and what, what kind of protection you need um, and how important trust is to the customer that you're serving. That's a good point. And it's particularly uh, poignant for B Corps, if did you guys all hear that, that for-profits have a legal obligation to maximize profits, and nonprofits have a legal obligation to maximize impact. So for organizations that have decided to be some kind of hybrid, it's really hard, because there is no legal requirement for the maximization of impact, while there is a legal requirement for the maximization of profit. So, you know, the only people who've done it at scale tend to be one-for-ones, like a Tom Shoes uh, or a Patagonia that has sustainable practices throughout their supply chain. Um, it's hard to do in the startup level. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So the question was, do we di differentiate between organizations that leverage tech versus tech nonprofits? And in the beginning, 
we're two years old. Uh, in the beginning, we did. So we said that you know, our accelerator was only gonna be for organizations in which they were building the product themselves or piecing together the product in which that was the core of their program delivery model. I think that will remain true for the accelerator because that's really what accelerators are good for. What we have done in the time since is we just launched the first ever directory of all tech nonprofits in the world. We hope it will become like the crunch base of tech nonprofits. You guys can look it up on our website. Um, it's searchable. You can find groups like Polaris Project uh, who are leveraging technology as the core of what they do in the world. Like I expect 10 years from now, my hope is that all nonprofits will be tech leveraged. There are a lot of things that have to change before that happens. And some of it is on people like me, on funders, that uh, funders typically are very restrictive about the kind of giving they do. So it's hard for nonprofits to hire technical staff. And it's hard to be a tech leveraged nonprofit if nobody on your team knows anything about software. So, um, you know, that's changing, but slowly. Um, and in the meantime, the ones that are doing it and identify as tech leveraged, we're happy to promote and make more visible as models for other organizations. Yeah. Google is our biggest investor, and they invest in all of our companies. And at the same time, they give free Google AdWords and Google credits for various things to the organizations we work with. Um, for, for a company like Serum, like a prescription drug donations, there's some really obvious corporate partnerships that they're working on right now um, to cut out the middlemen, if you will. And um, they're getting money from them right now, and they're getting free drugs that they then redistribute. But um, yeah, I think that's on the horizon. Yeah. So it has pretty big emphasis now placed on data and impact data, mm -hmm. which is great, except when you're really small. So how do you coach your uh, company through describing their impact yeah. when it might be one state or one school district or serving a really small population financially, mm -hmm. but doing something very promising and really awesome. Yeah. Here. The question is about how do you measure data in the beginning? And the truth is it's messy, right? Because you don't really know what your growth metric is going to be until you're in it. But until you have proven that you have served people and the service has worked, we encourage people to measure growth, right? Like the number of users on your platform or the number of people who have completed the education lesson, if you are Quill, it's like an open source education platform. Um, Nora Health is uh, it's a video platform for people in hospitals to help take care of their loved ones after a surgery or a major medical event. So we count how long they got through the video and if, the vid if they're watching the video for longer than they were before, right? So you're looking for growth in the user experience. And it may feel like a little bit of a vanity metric for those of you who work in tech, right? Like it's not, it doesn't have a ton of meaning at the moment, but it could. And honestly, that is how other people count in, in uh, the nonprofit space, right? Like if it was the soup kitchen in my house, I fed all the people in my house, right? Like have I changed hunger? Not yet, but I plan to. Um, so there is precedence for starting small and counting. But measurement, impact measurement in the nonprofit space is tough. It's not apples to apples for anything as opposed to profit. So um, this is a problem that we're continuing to think about. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a question on a metal, more metal level. Love it. But is there any technology um, uh, gaps or common needs amongst these groups that you're looking to serve as like a, a platform for them or a, a tech, technology nonprofit that's kind of assisting each of these companies in their individual missions? What an interesting question. So I would say like the infrastructure play in all these groups is stellar.org. 
and it's complicated, so hang with me. So Stellar.org is an infrastructure for money. They're trying to make tr the transferring of money as easy as the transferring of email, right? So it's, crypt it's a infrastructure for cryptocurrency. And the reason they built it is because right now, um, ha has anyone ever paid a fee to wire transfer? Right? Transferring money is really expensive. And people accessing their own money is really expensive. So if you were in Sweden and I wanted to send you some cash, it would cost me $35. So imagine if you're poor, you don't get to send cash. You also don't get to access your own cash because it costs the bank just $30 just to have you on their platform. So Stellar has de developed a code base that would allow people to transfer money for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a cent. So the reason, like, as a technology, it's an open source internet protocol. It's like SMTP for money. Uh, the reason it would impact all of these groups is because they're dealing with poor folks. So Stellar's grand vision is that people will build products on top of the code, and the code will then, people who are building products on top of that code will be able to serve people who have been unbanked and underbanked for a millennia, since there have been banks, honestly. Um, they had their first product built this year. It's through a microfinance institution in Nigeria called Aradian. Um, I can send you the article, it's really fascinating. Uh, within the first day of trading, people were like on it. It's like a mobile bank, so people who were getting micro loans didn't have to pay the transfer fee. So if you're getting a $50 loan, suddenly not having to pay 20 of it for the transfer fee makes a big difference. Um, that's the first product. They are looking for people to build products on their code. They're based here in San Francisco. They have meetups. It's a super interesting group of people um, who really believe that money should be free and accessible to anybody who's got it, just like the internet should be. You know the internet is managed by a nonprofit, the Worldwide Federation. Uh, yeah, so like there is precedence for this kind of business model. But um, yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would venture to argue that Stellar would actually have a few arguments for the problem of just being a wealthy investor. I mean, it was started, it was started by a woman who was sending money home to her grandma in Korea. Yeah. And she was like, I have to carry it in cash on a plane to get it to her safely, right? Like, I'm losing so much money in the transfer, I don't know that she gets to get it, right? Because I have uncles and what have you in the mix. Um, that's why they built Stellar. So yeah, like it has global implications. Our, even our groups who do not work internationally are still working with poor folks, so it will impact them. Um, yeah, the more we see the use of open source, I think um, open source for these kinds of infrastructure plays, uh, yeah, that's the future. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, um, so, and you think about it like a structure of a foundation. People who work at foundations typically understand the issue area that they're working in, right? They are experts in that. They don't necessarily know how to build a mobile app, how much money you should be paying developers in Venezuela, uh, what kind of, like, back-end architecture you need, right? They can't evaluate that. And so we work with those kinds of foundations to, like, trust us to get a group ready for their funding. Um, I hope that more and more foundations and family foundations will have technical people on their staff so that they are prepared to invest in these kinds of opportunities. And it's happening, like Soros just hired their first program officer who's a technical, like a fully technical program officer, and he is looking in the places where it's the Open Society Institute is the name of the foundation. Um, they're, he's looking at places in which they can, they already have a ton of investments, but need tech interventions to hold up those investments. Um, so it's starting, but philanthropy is notoriously slow, partly because you can't just like build things and break them and move on, like they're people. <laughs> those things are people. So um, it's slow for a reason, and it's our job to just build as fast as we can so that we can hold up these organizations that are doing cool work. Uh, I'm gonna go in the back because you have next. I'll come to you. Yeah. 
yeah. So the question is, what is the greatest value of the accelerator? And I, okay, when we started, I thought the thing they needed most was money and connections to mentors and then community. And two years in, I was wrong. The thing they needed most was community. When they come out of the accelerator, they're like, okay, like you are nice, Shannon, but I'm mostly excited that I got to meet these other founders who understand what I'm going through, who are solving problems in the way that I'm solving them, and I have a community of people to access when I need them most. The second thing they were most excited about were the mentors. Um, we've all been kind of blown away at how much, particularly the technology mentors, um, how desperate they were for meaningful philanthropic opportunities, right? Kind of like Kevin, like it's hard to find good groups to give your time, love, and energy to, right? It's, it's not easy. And finding people who sort of talk like them and sound like them and are thinking in the world the way that they do has really lifted up their spirits. And they've ended up serving on the boards of some of the organizations. They talk to them on a regular basis. And it's become this virtuous cycle. Um, and then the money. Because in the beginning, there's this capital crunch that's, that's real, right? Like, my guys are, you know, some of them are still living in them dorms. Many of them are living in hacker houses. It's not, um, it's not luxurious uh, in the beginning. So getting resources to be able to pay yourself so that you can do the work, to pay talented engineers so that you have the help in the work that you're doing. Um, it's really only through early investment that you get to scale. Most of them have revenue models. Tech really lends itself to revenue models in a way that like other nonprofits don't have that opportunity. So what sustainability looks like for these organizations is some level of earned revenue and some level of philanthropic investment for research and development. Yeah, I think there was a question back here. No, no. Nope. Okay. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, some people have, um, since a lot of tech companies have Google and Facebook, yeah. they have um, the resources in the bank for tech pilot projects and like baby tech developers. But when you're dealing with um, these tech nonprofits, right, the people who don't have you can't necessarily, you know, A/B test like critical like, access to people and things like that. So how do you encourage like innovation when the people who are most important and most insightful from the idea of like negative consequences of the way that these companies are funded? They don't look like Google, but they look just like other tech startups. Right, so like I would push the question back on you. How, when you're a tech startup, do you test product market fit? You find a subsample of people, you get out, you get your product out, you see what they're looking, you see how they use it, and then you just try it. Now, um, they have to put in some protection so they know that they're not hurting people in what they're building. Um, but that's where the leadership becomes critical. You want people who have an emotional connection to the issue, so they're thinking differently about their users and the use case. Um, you know, most startups don't get to true A-B testing until like year five. That's a misnomer in the world, right? <laughs> so that is true of these two. And you know, some of these will fail. And we're not doing our job if we're not choosing like, you know, enough interesting high-risk organizations that like all of them do great. If that's true, then we weren't doing a very good job picking. Yeah. So most of these companies are not B2B. A handful of them are. The ones that, yeah. Um, so when you're, I'm sorry, the question is, how do I? What is your advice to companies that it's critical that they they start selling the companies that they're becoming companies that to drive for funding? Yeah, like um, business development in the nonprofit space looks a lot like business development in the for-profit space. You have customers who may pay or need to be served, and someone's going to pay for that customer if they're not paying for themselves. And then you need investor partners who are willing to subsidize your customer pipeline until you have enough customers that can pay for themselves, or people willing to pay for those customers. 
So um, we teach sales funneling, just like any other startup would. Um, there is, I think people don't understand about individual fundraising. This is sort of like a misnomer in the field of nonprofits that when you, individual fundraising, like there's people who like you, so they give you money and it all just works out and things are cool. No, there's like 300 phone calls and you're following up with emails. Like it looks just like sales. Um, now maybe you have several sales channels and that channel may be an individual. It may be the company who's paying for the customer and it may be the customer itself, but it's the same operations. It's one of the reasons like we can use the same software. We as nonprofits can use the same software as for-profit companies because like it's just CRM at the end of the day. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Return on impact. So we give each of these groups $25,000. I want to know that the cost per beneficiary has gone down over time and the number of beneficiaries is ultimately going up. Um, before there's a critical mass of beneficiaries, the things I count are um, how many follow on funders did they get? So these groups in two years have raised an aggregate $15 million, which for uh, $275,000 that I've invested so far, not bad, right? In a for profit context. So um, we count earned revenue that came through introductions that we provided, increased headcount, because if you're going to scale, you're going to need more bodies than the three people living in your dorm room, uh, press mentions. That may seem like vanity, but honestly, like the more you're in mainstream press, it's visibility is a multiplier unlike anything else. So um, we need them to be public and telling their stories. And we spend a lot of time working with them on how to talk about what they do, which can be hard. If they were brought to the issue because they were interested in the technology, like Stellar, that is really hard to pitch to a press person in five minutes. Uh, if you were brought to the issue like Kia from Serum because you had a family member who couldn't afford prescription drugs, it's a different story. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are things like the roles are very similar and like the revenue model may be similar, but obviously the pay is like if you look at the corporate model, you have to pay more money to get the same amount of money. Yeah. And more cash. How do you address? So I would say those are averages that um, if you're working at a startup, a tech startup, you probably like you may make a little bit more with the promise of making a lot more through equity. But we all know people who work for places that didn't that didn't pan out. Um, so in the beginnings, the salaries are pretty comparable. It changes later on. Um, so you can't pay engineers half. You can pay engineers probably 80%. Um, there are other things that are pretty great about working for a nonprofit. And um, the number one thing I think is that you like never question what you're building. And for people who've ever had to build a widget like that matters, right? Like when you are working hard and late and um, you know, it's it, meaning matters. So there are fringe benefits of working for a nonprofit that um, are not financial. But like we often have very good benefits. No ping pong tables. No. How do you how do you source your teams or your business development? How do you find organizations that you can support? Um, I hope some of you will start tech nonprofits. So you're looking at part of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, we use our networks just like any VC would. Like I spend a lot of time in person meeting people talking to people about their ideas, helping them think through the early stages of their products. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to media because again, visibility, that's the only way people are going to know about us. Our application is open until April 1st. Uh, so if any of you are noodling on a tech nonprofit, come talk to me and we can get you through the process. Um, yeah, like deal flow is the most important thing for a VC. It is also the most important thing for a philanthropic investor.
Yeah. I imagine a lot of people in this room support him at this point, but there are groups that are going to be maybe impacted and see it all from more people in different groups. The question I'm going to ask you is about that. I'm curious if you talk about all these companies you made and when you started, I imagine this was the point where you really didn't give a shit about the company you started with, correct? Mm-hmm. So it depends on the company, um, but scale is everything. Like if you can't hit scale, uh, you will remain one of those nonprofits that sort of is stuck in the under million dollar annual budget service delivery kind of model. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about growth hacking and like what are tipping points for scale and how do you get the groups there? I would say with our groups, some of the problems with scale are a little bit different than you would see in a typical nonprofit, like NextLeaf Analytics. NextLeaf Analytics is sensor technology that tests whether or not a vaccine has died. So vaccines die more from cold than they do from heat. Because you know when you have a refrigerator and the power goes off, the fan in the refrigerator goes and goes and goes and goes, and it ends up freezing the vaccines, which are mostly live. So you could be a country who thinks you've fully vaccinated your population, and then you have a measles outbreak. Um, and the solution has typically been to replace the refrigerators. But it turns out that's really expensive and refrigerators fail because of uh, power outages, not, um, and there's a cheaper way to do it. So NextLeaf sells the, sen the sensor technology that sends a text to the health worker, costs 20 bucks, and they've been able to, they got a deal with the Indian government to scale to all, to three Indian states, the three most vulnerable Indian states in which they knew they probably had failures in their vaccine supply chain. That opportunity is awesome, right? But they didn't have the money to like ramp up their manufacturing. They didn't have the product management resources to take the person who was building the technology, who was the CEO and primary technologist, to take her when she to take her off what she needed to be doing, which was negotiating with the Indian government. So they didn't have anybody else who could build the product. Like they were in this sort of crisis personnel moment. Um, and the really the only thing that fixes that is money and time. And so, like, scale wasn't the problem for them. By the end of this year, when we met them, they had served 200,000 people. By the end of next year, they will have served 7 million. Right? Like, it has incredible potential, but, like, there are things that are hard for organizations that have this huge growth spurt, but they don't have the opportunity to um, build the infrastructure up for it. Okay. I think I have time for two more questions, and then we'll... mentioned that the way that investors choose to invest in these types of nonprofits here is primarily based on the social impact of connecting that with their profit. Um, I'm wondering though, like, so how do you typically, for them, do they do it as just a philanthropic venture or do they do it as their monthly plan to do it as an investment? Yeah, what a great question. So um, it depends. <laughs> Some of them believe that it is a that it's a purely philanthropic play. They're interested in making sure more kids are educated, more kids are vaccinated, so that's why they give the money. Um, often the money is sitting in a donor advised fund, which happened after a liquidity event. So the money has already been sent someplace. They're like their investment is like warm, you know, their ROI is like warm fuzzies, not necessarily like hard numbers, except for Stellar. Stellar is really interesting. Stellar got started with debt financing from Stripe. So Stripe is a credit card processing company. And the reason Stripe is interested in Stellar is because they want to make it easier to process credit cards. Right? Like, if it works, it will be transformative and incredible and incredible when it works. Uh, so, you know, they are going after it for profit motive, which has been true in the philanthropic world for two centuries, right? Like, the Rockefellers were interested in infrastructure, but they were interested in infrastructure because it benefited the services they were building in their business. You know, like, you know, we all have interests. <laughs> Sometimes they're complicated. <laughs> yeah, you wanna have an interest in beer now and socializing? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, um, thank you so much.
for having me. And if you guys have any questions, I'm going to hang out and answer anything. But um, I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm so grateful that you spend your free time thinking about these issues as I do. So thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. How many of you thought that was awesome? Yeah, I did too. And thank you so much for spending the time with us and educating us about these issues. Um, you know, I have so many friends. I work at a tech company. Nobody I know has the answers to all these questions. And so I appreciate you taking the time to tell us a little bit about what we know so then we can go out and educate our friends as well. Um, a few ways to stay in touch with us. One, tell a friend. If you liked this event, we have these every month through June. And if you know somebody who would benefit or find these kinds of events interesting, tell them. Tell them to go to our website, ycore.org, and sign up for our email list so they can find out as soon as you do. Second, we have 19 volunteers in our program this year. I would love to have 100 next year. But Simon and I do this in our free time. And in order to reach as many people as I think there is interest for, we need to hire someone. We need to find office space. We need all of the things that you know these fledgling tech nonprofits that Shannon is supporting. Um, we need those too. So you can go to ycore.org, pull out your phone, donate, and help support us and help support future volunteers um, like you. And lastly, um, you can volunteer. So we have our six-month program cycle. We're in the middle of it now. Um, we are also launching a new project that will run for the next couple of months to help us understand the young professional volunteer demographic and help us understand how, how we can best reach these future volunteers and help continue to change the future of philanthropy from a young person's perspective. So we'll be emailing that, and you can um, watch for signups. Applications are due on March 31st. So those are three ways that you can stay in touch with us and get involved. We'll also stick around after this um, so you can talk to any of us and, and learn more about the program and learn more about how this has personally impacted us. But for now, thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Shannon, for spending some time with us tonight. Thank you.